Ну вот, все участники вроде бы собрались. Okay, uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. And traditionally, we have a full room here. That's very pleasant uh, for us. And we start working. Uh, that's the seventh international conference. But for Rossi Sivodnya, that is uh, the third time that uh, this venue is offered for the readings of our compatriot, uh, prominent thinker, Alexander Zinoviev. My congratulations uh, to you on the beginning of our work. Good, mo uh, good afternoon. Traditionally, before start launching our discussion, we allocate uh, some time for very important uh, thing, for awards uh, that are to be handed on behalf of the Zinoviev Club and um, Biography Institute of Alexander Zinoviev. And this is a very prominent um, event uh, ceremony that we allocate time for um, before uh, at the beginning of readings. And it is uh, co-chairperson of uh, the Zinoviev Club, Olga Mironovna uh, Zinoviva, who will announce the award winners. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I welcome you, all those who share our joy, all those who made an enormous contribution for the first and second sec uh, and so on, and the seventh readings to take place. Uh, during the seven, uh, 10 years of our work, we have done a lot. Uh, we have uh, created uh, a very fruitful um, relationship with uh, our community and with the international community. And the possibilities that are offered to the Zinoviev Club and to the Bi um, Biography Institute, uh, Research Institute, uh, is uh, to pay tribute to our compatriots. And this is the uh, joy that I would like to sh share with you. Today, unfortunately, Irina Bokova failed to come and join us, uh, Director General of UNESCO. It is to her that, by decision of our club, uh, we uh, award her with a medal. This is an anniversary uh, medal to, the, uh, to commemorate 90th anniversary of Alexander uh, Zinoy for her high ethical standing for multi-year work to preserve spiritual and cultural heritage of uh, the humanity. And I invite Mr. Kostov, uh, Kostov uh, a prominent uh, figure on his own, ambassador to the UN, and the person uh, who have done a lot uh, for to uh, preserve peace in our world, to preserve love and hope. Dimitar, you are welcome. <laughs> this is the certificate and um, the medal that are to be handed to Ms. Bokova. This year, we awarded two philosophical awards and one in literature. This is the first time that we could afford that. And the Intellectual Prize 2016 is awarded to Yuri Saladuhin. This very nice and beautiful certificate goes to Yuri Saladuhin. Saladuhin. Definitely he deserves it. And Valentina Ivanovna Montvienko this morning invited him to go back to office to work. And we will pass the certificate to him and committing with a gift that is appropriate. Intellectual Award 2016 goes to Michael Kekman. A uh, person uh, the, who is a legend in our uh, Zinoviev uh, and Hill uh, translated his works and explained to Russian speaking and English speaking um, audience the um, 
the phenomenon uh, of Zinoviev, Michael, um, the certificate is yours. And the first literature award of Alexander Zinoviev goes to Pavel uh, Fokin. Pavel Fokin, we invite you to the podium. That's the man who created an, a comprehensive biography of Alexander uh, Zinoviev, uh, Prometheum, uh, the discarded one. E Prometheus they rejected, and I am sure that this is uh, the first uh, literature award, but I am sure that there will be a whole number of uh, future literature awards that will be given to him. Thank you very much for your contribution. Dear colleagues, uh, this very brief uh, ceremony of opening is over. Now we get to the essence of our work. The theme of uh, Zinoviev readings this year is Alexander Zinoviev, the reality of planned history. Well, all in all, it's um, about uh, us living not only on the earth, but also in a or a certain reality, and people have guessed that quite uh, guessed that quite um, long ago. The first uh, person who formulated that more or less clearly was Karl Marx, and then Alexander Zinoviev uh, just made another step, saying that people live uh, just not on the earth, not uh, just among, uh, not surrounded by seas and oceans and forests and uh, hills, but they li live in a particular world uh, with prices, uh, with goals and plans and thoughts and ideas. People set go goals, develop plans how to attain them. And this is the world where we live in. This is the reality that may be for us uh, uh, even more important as human beings than the uh, physical world around us, uh, with, which, is, uh, can, which can be regarded as something uh, permanent, unchanging. But the world, the longer we live, the faster it, change, uh, it changes, according to Zinoviev. The more difficult it becomes for a human being to live, because they have to catch up with all the sociological processes. And Alexander Zinoviev said that starting with a certain point, uh, this accelerated human world uh, the world of human thinking and th uh, human activity has achieved such a point of development that history itself has become a subject of a um, person's activity. People virtually began to plan their own history. And natural processes are no longer uh, part of uh, reality. Uh, that was the firm belief of Alexander Zinoviev. And that is why it's not accidental that we decided to dedicate the Zinoviev uh, readings this year to reality of planned history. Because in uh, the Zinoviev Club, we believed it necessary to understand how this planned history is organized and understand something about it that's extremely important, how otherwise we'll be able to live in the reality of plan history if we do not understand it, if you are completely helpless with, uh, uh, without this understanding. So I hope that we'll make very important steps, maybe small ones, but still important, to become clearer about planned history through our discussion. So I uh, open the first panel. No sound. I have a strong voice, so I'll try to speak without microphone. Oh, oh. It's better with a microphone. So the first panel of our discussion uh, uh, is uh, its topic is who forms the global world order and how. A different way to ask this question is the framework of our 
um, session is who and how plans uh, the global world order. And so the floor is uh, given to Olga Zinoviva. It's my pleasure to pass microphone to you. Thank you very much. If you permit me, I will read what I've uh, prepared to save your time and save time for the future uh, speakers. A planned history aggressively imposed uh, on the, for the agenda of the 21st century generates uh, um, feelings of um, alienation, uh, like uh, the clones that are developed in um, laboratories that generate diseases um, to, stud to be studied. History is created uh, by peoples and people who are some uh, model for their compatriots, uh, those who live together at the same time, and for those future generations. All those present here may get into a look into uh, encyclopedia and go through the whole of events and list of people who marked um, uh, who marked uh, their presence in history and uh, became memorial, uh, mem memorable. But uh, we also may leave um, some um, steps on the history, but that is something that is not good. That's something that leads to uh, evasion and erasure of uh, certain things in history, like uh, uh, the tarnish. There are attempts to, t uh, to teach people to become indifferent uh, to a series of college revolution. The samples of uh, big and small conflicts, uh, acts of war, local and non-local wars that all together have uh, uh, blunted uh, the feeling of concern and uh, they uh, make people uh, become an indifferent uh, to what is happening. This is the factor of planned history. This is something that introduces in the uh, in, uh, general consciousness uh, falsification and twist of the true facts of uh, life. Sometimes these attempts are uh, successful at uh, the media level. Uh, they may uh, rank uh, high uh, in the list of news and the thunderstorm um, continuously going, then people stopped uh, drawing attention to that. And that's what those who create history want to achieve. I call them anti dumergs of uh, today. Who are they? What are these uh, anti-heroes, Obamas, uh, Valenses, Poroshenkos, Clintons? They are marginal fi uh, figures in history. They are temporary features. Uh, who are, uh, who are, uh, structures that are built without foundation. There are those that will be demolished in future. But on the other hand, we see uh, a Chinese new history with wise and uh, wisdom and attention, um, having corrected all the mistakes of the Soviet era, attracting um, using the creative uh, aspect of the Soviet era. They didn't discard. Uh, communist ideology, but they focused on economic um, uh, pro pro uh, uh, problems and issues. They combined positive things of socialism and uh, capitalism. They didn't say no to uh, communist ideology, and I stress uh, that. Uh, if you look with attention at, uh, at, uh, at, at the history um, that they study, even if we uh, just look at uh, the uh, cinema produced uh, day to day, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the national television shows uh, new films about the leaders of the country, about revolution, about its uh, right for its own uh, development with over 1.5 billion uh, population. Every second film is um, finished with, uh, um, uh, with international um, in uh, Chinese, so all that, tr uh, that all that uh, can explain the phenomenon of uh, Chinese miracle wonder, and this gives uh, hope for the future. This is also part of the planned history, but pla uh, planned history with a, a positive uh, sign because that's something creative. But what are the antipodes doing that dairy? Um, 
saying that they may uh, reverse history and create new geopolitical boundaries. They are very eager to turn the clock um, go, or in a different uh, direction. They want uh, the whole um, humanity to lose their memory. Um, those who do not belong to the golden um, memory. Uh, Zinoviev, in his book uh, West, said that the specific uh, features of Westernism is to create certain conditions to force uh, peoples and people to collaborate at, uh, on the terms that are favorable to the West. And virtually, this is a new uh, version of colonialism, uh, something that happened after the Second World War with the count of those changes. Uh, lawlessness and all permittedness, uh, ignorance that are um, uh, culminated by uh, absolute ignorance and uh, there are those uh, that were Nobel Law Prize winners, they, uh, uh, they support banditism and uh, terrorism in many countries. They give birth to the myths that those uh, who uh, fight under the uh, Star and Strip banner were the only winners in the Second World War. They are those who rewrite history books and make others do that. They create trial, which is called the Hague trial. There are those who return the uh, Stepan Bandera and other criminals. They're true fascists. They destroy monuments of culture, burn books, and burn those uh, who disagree with them. There are those who have uh, launched uh, witch uh, hunts all over the world. It is they who see the main danger in Russia and its, in its uh, president, Vladimir Putin. The main set uh, of uh, of anti um, demiurgs to lie more, to uh, reach it, uh, to come, uh, to bring it to the point of absurdity, and become the only power with impeccable reputation of true murders. We shouldn't forget their heroic deeds in inverted uh, comma in Hiroshima, Afghanistan, Congo, Yugoslavia, Syria, and the list may be continued. Uh, just several dozens of uh, countries that are part of our history. They are creators of uh, geopolitical bastards like uh, uh, Ukraine that uh, tear down lawful, uh, lawful um, governments and set up a shale uh, world order everything that doesn't fit into the programming of their world. They want to destroy everything that is not uh, theirs. So they're cheaters and uh, thieves, but not partners at all. They have no such um, notions as uh, human decency. They want to make others bend uh, to their power. They are eager to do anything, whatever they wish, even to negate what was created in their own uh, uh, country. So what has happened? Uh, back in the past, uh, there were uh, some literature which were created of a Nobel Prize level, such as the American Tragedy, books by Selinger and uh, Kaufman. There were films uh, which were of uh, a great world level, for example, those on the Nuremberg Process. And even in this century, the deceived American society is uh, not in the power to resist uh, this flow of lies uh, to join the anti-Russia movement, which uh, is uh, actually a lie and uh, a part of propaganda machine. Barack Obama is uh, going to fade in the history. His uh, only historical image would be an image of a maniac who covered uh, the deaths of uh, hundreds of thousands of people and uh, the bloody crimes of neo-colonialism of the 21st century masqueraded uh, as uh, a laureate of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, no ever uh, human has uh, ever deceived everyone so cynically. This was the first uh, black president of the United States uh, who behaved as a real abhorrent racist uh, as a follower of uh, the most uh, uh, terrible racial series of uh, dominance of one, some nations over others, while Russia remains the only hope of uh, peace uh, in our world. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Olga. Now we move on to the discussion of uh, this topic with the participants of the first panel. And first of all, I would like to address Mr. Wimmer, former State Secretary in the Ministry of Defense of Germany, because I believe that the German history, particularly after war, was an example of a new type of planning. Take just the idea of a common well-being, which was born and implemented in Germany by Mr. Erhard. We remember very well how Germany implemented a project approach in terms of the reunification of the two Germanys. And the Germans were always very good at setting goals, at developing plans and implementing them. And just yesterday or the day before yesterday, Mr. Steinmeier, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany, said frankly that the European Union was now at the threshold of a very deep crisis. And he stated that no one in the European Union knew what to do with that crisis. That was the opinion of Steinmeier. He actually surprised me. He said that the only thing that he thought uh, was necessary was uh, to meet the people and talk to them. And uh, I think uh, this was not a way to find a solution in the European Union. But nevertheless, is there a solution? Do the Europeans have a solution? Do the Germans have a solution when they are faced uh, with the crisis uh, which uh, threatens the entire European community? What do you think? Dear Mrs. Zinovieva, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that you, not all of you, speak German. So now you will have to put on your simultaneous interpretation devices and hope that the translation will be correct. Uh, there is certain experience with respect to difficult topics. We have met today in order to talk about the great spiritual power, Alexander Zinoviev, and other things. And we are talking about the heritage left behind by this great spiritual power. Here, awards were given for the biography of Alexander Zinoviev. And we, if we look at uh, the chained Prometheus, uh, we will find something very topical. Prometheus loved people. And he was too close to gods, which is why he was chained uh, to a rock. And that is the situation in which we are all today. Today, it's necessary to have the right evaluation and uh, to set Prometheus free. In my country and in other countries, there are many people who believe that we need someone who will love people because we are in a situation which is so complicated as nothing we have ever lived through in our lives which is why it's so important that people have the opportunity to speak, to share what they have in their heart, to do this independently or via the free media. I live in a country where there has always been media pluralism, but today it's no more the case. In our major media, we have been observing that the pluralism of opinions has disappeared, 
and now we listen to the drums of war. As to the freedom of our media, and as to what we can tell our peoples, uh, is something to which we should be grateful to Russia today and Sputnik. This is something that provides pluralism in our country, which we cannot provide by our own efforts anymore. And this situation shows that the development uh, of those events uh, went in the wrong direction. If we only follow the German media, we would have no single voice reflecting the real opinion of the German population. Presently, this is particularly challenging. We are now at a situation which has already existed in the past. And Zinoviev paid our attention, turned our attention to historical events. Next year, we will mark 100 years of the Versailles uh, Treaty, the end of World War I by signing this treaty and uh, this conference at Versailles. And we, the Germans, have experience uh, connected with this. This is the same experience that Russia is living today. But the German Empire has uh, put down its arms, uh, hoping to follow the 40 points of the American president, uh, such as democracy and self-determination for the Germans. What did we have as a result? We had Versailles, the Versailles Treaty, which was uh, an open door To, which would and, and actually the end of the Cold War and the reunification of uh, Germany would be impossible without uh, help from the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union made a greater contribution to the end of the Cold War and reunification of Germany than many other nations. Uh, what did the Soviet Union get as a result? And the Russian Federation afterwards. Uh, the forces of NATO, the armies of NATO at the western uh, border of Russia. And this brings me back to an important meeting in 1988, the headquarters where there was uh, the secret nations of Russia and uh, the CIA leadership told me at that time everything that we have told you about the uh, in the recent years and decades uh, about the uh, Warsaw Agreement. Forget about this. The Soviet Union does only one thing. It only protects Russia. Starting from the era of Hitler and Napoleon, they take this experience into consideration to protect their nation. And if we look at the situation today, and if we remember what is expecting us, what we should expect now, then there is the issue arising in Moscow, what's happening now at the western border. This is reminiscent of Hitler and Napoleon. And I emphasize this because at the end of the Cold War, and here we have one of the architects of the end of the Cold War, the Ambassador Fallen. Back then, we promised signing the Charter in Paris uh, to draw conclusions. War should not go back to Europe. Europe must be peaceful, but uh, sometime after the reunification of my country in Paris, uh, we 
had a nose that democracy, liberty, and uh, freedom should uh, dominate in Europe. And what did we have as a result? NATO, which had in the past been a defense alliance, a limited one, limited by the territory of uh, Germany. But after the war in Yugoslavia, we had a machine of aggression which set the task despite the UN Charter to continue this aggression and um, we don't have anything else or don't have any other choice other than establish a clear view of history and see once again what conclusions should be made from the tragedy and draw conclusions based uh, on uh, the theory of Zinoviev, which is about loving people. You have mentioned the United Nations, and I would like to give the floor to Mr. Dimitar Kostov, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to UN from Bulgaria. I believe that this is another part of our world order, which held this world order starting from at least the end of World War II. And we have been hearing all the time about uh, attempts uh, to reorganize or reform the United Nations uh, in, in order to ensure safety and security. And sometimes uh, people ask questions, how should we reform the United Nations? What exactly do you propose? Uh, and then there is an awkward pause first. And then uh, people say, well, let's cancel everything. And then we will invent how it is going to be. Let's just uh, remove the veto right. Let's rewrite the charter, the regulations of the United Nations, and then we'll uh, find out how to reorganize this system. And there is a suspicion that when people do not mention their goals and plans, what, what do they want to do? There is a suspicion that they want to deceive us. At least we always have this suspicion. From your point of view, reorganization of this institution or its removal, is it one of the historical plans that we need to support or that we need to oppose? You can talk for, right from the audience. There's a mic there. If that's more convenient for you, then please, you're welcome. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like uh, to amend one thing or correct one thing. I am a former ambassador. I had a 40-year career in the United Nations and uh, other multinational and international organizations uh, in the diplomatic domain. And I would also like to thank for the invitation to this authoritative forum. And I would like to thank the organizers And first of all, my friend Olga Zinovieva. Because for me, this is a great honor to participate in such a forum. And to listen to Alexander Zinoviev, who is the greatest philosopher, thinker, and writer of our time, who spoke on many issues. And I hope it will help us in finding our way in the context of today's uh, sophisticated and degrading world and also preserve and reinforce the moral values, the moral imperative, which 
should be the foundation of public life. As is well known, after World War II, the entire history was determined, first of all, uh, by the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. They went through a period of confrontation and then detente, which um, alternated like seasons of the year. And nevertheless, uh, the bipolar model of uh, international relations proved to be very sustainable, and the world had no direct military confrontation between the two blocs. When we think why it so happened, we need to take into account the fact that this uh, structure was uh, mm, intended in such a way and designed in such a way that no one would be able to rule the world. That was what the fathers, founders of this world organization wanted to do. Yesterday, it turned 71 years since the launch of this organization and its charter came into effect on the 24th of October, 1945, as uh, a reflection of the indomitable will of uh, the powers uh, to prevent a new world war. 71 years later, we can state that all the principles and norms of the UN Charter, all the ideas in it, are still significant. They have acquired uh, global recognition, and they are the core of the entire international law. Well, let us re recall a bit of history of uh, the, uh, the UN. First, it was under the dominance of the United Na uh, States and led by them. But until 1960s, it was uh, the tool of uh, Cold War in the mid 1960s, as we all remember well, the period of decolonization was launched, and the Soviet Union, together with other socialist states, supported uh, by non-aligned uh, nations, uh, changed the balance of forces in the UN in spite of the resistance from the colonial states. So for this reason, we may say that liberation of over 130, uh, 132 nations in particular, their freedom from colonialism and support uh, to them to strengthen their sovereignty uh, and statehood was uh, um, culmination of the best achievement of the UN. The end of the Cold War did not create conditions as we all hoped for, for a strong peace and uh, collaboration within the organization. There was a very brief period uh, of time during in um, the 1980s when it was uh, revived, uh, just experienced some revival, uh, when there were some um, blue hamlets um, operations and a number of uh, actions uh, taken then. The then uh, President um, George Bush uh, moved forward the doctrine of New World Order uh, the essence of which was to recognize uh, the recognition of regulation of all international conflicts uh, according to the UN Charter. And that st uh, his stand was supported. Then uh, the Council of uh, Security Council 
was a, uh, supported uh, the UN or uh, the military actions of uh, uh, the United States uh, to support uh, territorial integrity of Kuwait and was against Iraq. But uh, then we discovered that there was nothing but uh, to have a propagandistic win over uh, in the war in Iraq in the Persian Gulf. But uh, for a very short period of time, it uh, seemed to us that great powers acted together. Um, that was in uh, the 1990s, and that the veto right uh, exists to prevent uh, just a single decision. And uh, the world may hope uh, for a longer period of peace. But unfortunately, the end of uh, the Cold War didn't bring security to everyone. On the contrary, old threats and dangers uh, and military conflicts in various uh, places of the world and financial conflicts uh, were multiplied by um, by terrorism and jihad. All that creates uh, uncertainties and fear of the future. Why is it like that? After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States uh, believed to be the only wor rule of the world, and they took the course of experts of uh, their model of democracy without taking into consideration uh, the wish, uh, uh, the will and tradition of other nations. And the consequences of this course is not only a collapse of a number of stable regimes in Asia and Africa, but also a flow of migrants and refugees to Europe that uh, questions the stability and ex the very existence of the European Union. Besides that, uh, the system of uh, treaties uh, to control weapons um, is collapsed that had been built for dozens of years and through the contribution of generations of political leaders, experts, and diplomats. On the other hand, when Russia, headed uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, President uh, Putin, took the course of strengthening its uh, economic and strategic uh, position and uh, stood to protect its uh, real geopolitical interests, uh, all that generated very acute response from some um, Western leaders. And that is perceived uh, as a threat to the global leadership um, of the United States. No doubt, Russia continues uh, Still, uh, still takes a big territory in uh, Europe and in Asia. That is something that cannot be changed. And in the womb of that territory, you have enormous uh, riches of natural reserves. Um, the country is restoring its economic and military force. And that is something that is not liked by those who rule the world now. They would have preferred to. Uh, uh, they would prefer if Russia satisfied itself with the role of a secondary uh, player, just supplier of uh, natural uh, resources and energy to uh, Europe. But this is something that is not possible, and the problem is not in the, the actions taken by Russia, but in the fact that the United States in practice showed themselves in, uh, incapable of managing their challenges in the world and in fact I recognized that that is possible only uh, together with Russia and through collaborative efforts of all states interested in that. Just let us recall how the issue with chemical weapons in Syria was tackled, negotiations with Iran about its nuclear uh, program and some other um, 
aspects. Uh, we should uh, remember that uh, shift to monocentrism has exhausted itself. There are new uh, centers of power in the world. So we, the world is moving towards polycentrism. The current situation is different. The content of uh, the um, uh, notion of threat and uh, to peace and stability has changed. But in spite of all that, uh, with the risk uh, and um, with the challenges to survival of the world, uh, the United Nations is uh, the peaceful harbor uh, for uh, efficient um, settlements, and we need to uh, continue these efforts. I'm uh, sure that all responsible governments uh, will would support uh, Mr. Antoine uh, Guterres, uh, who has uh, all necessary qualities uh, for uh, the office that he is awarded with uh, to reform the United Nations uh, according to its uh, charter with the new um, life uh, circumstances. And naturally, the UN reform means that uh, its efficiency should be continued as the main organization, as the uh, central organization for resolution of all uh, disputes. This is impo something impossible if the main principles uh, of that are not preserved. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Mr. Kostov, um, I would like to ask a couple of questions to you. Tomorrow, uh, for the first time, I'll go to Bulgaria just for one day. So tomorrow I will um, begin my day in uh, Sofia, and um, I'm very happy that that will happen. And it is not that often that um, we travel to that country, but you uh, wished uh, Good luck in his very difficult work to the new Secretary General, but we were really anxious uh, about uh, and concerned with the whole situation of selection of Secretary General. We remember that uh, Bulgarian representative and uh, actually, uh, as you know, of club uh, awarded her with a medal. She was a true uh, one of the most probable uh, candidates to that uh, uh, post. But then a very interesting thing happened. And we are speaking about planned history and planned actions, but the modern rulers of the world try to do that behind the um, curtains. And this time the curtains uh, draw down, and Mr. Merkel actually stopped, uh, walked into the floor and said some words about it. And everybody saw that uh, things were done, not in a democratic way, to put it softly. Well, interesting thing, Bulgaria. And we remember that in the, 19, uh, in the early 1990s, they said that uh, now, finally, we will be independent without the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, we see several things happening, starting with the gas pipeline and ending with the selection of a procedure for the post of uh, Secretary uh, General. So we see that uh, it's, uh, Bulgaria's independence is not that manifested. What is the future ahead for the country? You are right. For me, that was a great, uh, they gave me um, that was a great grief for me, uh, gave me a lot of sadness. Uh, Irina Borkova, who has worked f in uh, UNESCO for a number of years and was a very good candidate uh, to this po uh, post, she was fully supported by the government at first, but uh, then um, somehow, not very clearly, although it is clear why, from the because of the pressure from outside, the um, head of the government changed its uh, his uh, position and nominated a different candidate, and that was unprecedented. That is something new in theory of interna uh, in the theory of um, international relations. Uh, and that angered uh, many people in uh, Bulgaria. And I believe this uh, may anger may manifest itself on the during the selections on the uh, during the elections on the third of um, 
no uh, November. Now we go a little bit to the south of the Balkans, and I would like to welcome Dimitris uh, Patilis. Uh, thank you for joining us and, uh, in uh, Zinovic readings. It is very precious uh, when we have participants from Greece in philosophic events, uh, because we cannot forget uh, what is the cradle of philosophy that would be um, uh, insane from a historical point of view. If we uh, turn from ancient Greeks to modern Greeks, uh, Greece, uh, just recently, last week actually, uh, an event happened. There was a non-formal um, meeting of leaders of the south of Europe. And uh, in uh, and in uh, that happened uh, uh, mainly because of uh, Mr. Renzi's uh, very tough position on uh, sanctions against Russia. Is it uh, just a uh, um, situation uh, just uh, that uh, was formed like that, or it is a whole trend that uh, the south of Europe may form itself into an independent player? I'd like to take the place of the rostrum. Mr. Patelis is professor of philosophy. This is a very interesting uh, question that you raised. I will delay answer to it. Uh, yeah, just uh, that I gave it as a background uh, for your presentation. First of all, I would like to thank you for invitation, for the honor of uh, um, participating in the Zinoviev readings. That's the second time that I'm here. I apologize for my Greek accent in Russian. I would like to say that we live in the times when uh, we need to create uh, platforms for communication, platforms for um, mutual understanding and for converging our views. And it, it is not necessary for us to agree on all points of the agenda, but the very desire to converge and to reach understanding is important. Why? Uh, to begin with, I stem uh, from uh, uh, from my experience. I was uh, fortunate uh, to to graduate from the philosophical uh, school of the Moscow State University. I remember it very well uh, back in the 1980s that a whole laboratory of thought we not always agreed with each other, and our professors at that time were uh, quite often disagreed with each other, but that was a platform for us to discuss. And Alexander Zinoviev, uh, graduate and professor of uh, my alma mater, um, and my teacher, uh, Victor Zazulin, also is a graduate and professor of the same university. Uh, his um, tenure is younger than Alexander Zinoviev, and uh, they once uh, they had uh, common interests, but then they diverged and their focuses changed. Um, but uh, late, uh, years later, the different uh, philosophical schools, different uh, platforms and methodological um, directions tend to converge because of the deep necessity, necessity and historical um, uh, logic. So the question about uh, future, is it planned? Is it planable? We need to uh, consider historical process as a whole, comprehensively. And here it is not enough to lean on geopolitical and geostrategical approach. When we have just geopolitical or geostrategical support or, um, or approach on the surface, I would, I would say it's too late. This is uh, we're on the verge of war. That is a co uh, opposition between blocks um, of uh, nations. But we need to look into the depths of the foundation. What leads to such uh, oppositions? What leads to such? Um, 
controversions. And then we again need to look at back into the history. And the Zinoviev Club uh, quite often refers to po post Marxism. We may disagree on the term, but according to the logic of historical and logic school, school of logics, we need to develop uh, the fundamental theory and methodology of uh, studies of society as a whole. Uh, we should study uh, historical uh, logic and uh, prospects of it. Philosophy is not a rhetorics about something. It, it is not just a new form of art for the sake of art. Philosophy, if it is a true philosophy, it comes from antiquity, and you were right saying about mentioning that. It is uh, the, something that uh, uh, studies uh, the fundamental uh, lo lo logic of the development of the humanity on a scientific basis. So uh, leaning on the public uh, social uh, philosophy and philosophy of history uh, and uh, uh, leaning on the achievements of Marxist theory, we need to get to the uh, dialectic uh, develop, uh, creative development of that. If philosophy if science is science, we cannot discard what is obsolete or seems to be obsolete. There is a logical development of science always happens in such a way that new facts come into the fore and science needs to describe objectively the new reality, um, the new being, and why and how that is happening according to what uh, laws and uh, on the basis of all that then get to the scientific forecast, foreseeing. And science that does not fulfill this, uh, just does not follow this line, is not, sci is not scientific. Uh, so logic of history is something very complex. Uh, it is multifaceted. And we need to uh, follow the uh, scientific methodology. Uh, methodolo uh, methodology. I invite you uh, to look at um, the papers that were published on our site uh, on the International School of uh, Philosophy. And we uh, want to, uh, we strive to uh, um, study the uh, new reality. During the, uh, during the 20th century, some fundamental changes of the uh, human uh, humanity have taken place took place we saw what w were the early socialist revolutions that is the historical process that was not linear the um, the doctrine that uh, prevailed uh, the official marxist documents explains that uh, through a linear um, and um, in a very rough form if we study history or even look at historical analogies uh, moving on from one formation to another from feudalism to capitalism happened in the most advanced countries of europe uh, over five centuries And thinking that uh, transition to a new society, to socialism, is automatic. That's what someone thought. Uh, you just need to push the button. But this is not the case. If we look at the history of earlier bourgeois revolutions, all of those revolutions uh, were a failure. And then the feudalism and absolute monarchy came back. Does it mean that there is no future, there is no alternative? I have no time to explain it in depth, but a transition of the humanity to a unified society, this is what Marx called communism, is not a utopia, as some people say. This uh, is uh, a logical procedure, but this is a historical law of a different order not uh, in the mechanicist spirit. Uh, this is a range of opportunities uh, at certain historical moments involving people, involving mankind. Uh, 
And uh, of course, we cannot talk about planning without the subject uh, of that planning. And what, what is it? Subject. It's another historical law. As uh, the material and spiritual culture of humanity develops, the need for a particular historical subject becomes even greater. Of course, history has no target setting. History has no theologism. It has no fatalism. There is no superhuman person, but there is a certain logic behind history. This means that on the one hand, the processes uh, moving along societies require planning, and this becomes uh, a scientific process of production and reproduction of uh, human life in the society. But we also need a strategic thinking and planning, which means that on the one hand, there is the objective law of planning, and on the other hand, there are various options of planning. And let's look at the positions uh, of whether it is possible to do this scientific planning. In the present situation, after the disintegration of the Soviet Union and uh, the dominance uh, of uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, superpowers, some people started uh, uh, counterattack movement. And uh, we can see what the results were. In the, during the World War, in the Cold War, there was also some axis of resistance. And uh, today there is also an axis of those who oppose the dominance of the United States. Within this axis, there are a lot of contradictions. But for the time being, those contradictions are part of one single global goal. If we look at the global change, uh, there are some separate or individual processes, uh, for example, some parts of uh, neocolonialism or some kinds of uh, debt um, dependence, uh, for example, between Greece and the EU, is uh, parts of this process, the process of unfolding not a cold but a hot world war. And uh, this uh, has uh, the form of uh, crisis management, hybrid war. There are different names to it, for example, a network war and so on. You know the literature, but those are parts of uh, one big process. Something that's happening in Libya, in Syria, in Donbass, in Afghanistan, in Greece, uh, at the periphery of the European Union are parts of the same process. What do those? who have prepared the scenario of their own planning think. They were based on their own interests uh, with respect to the global community and the entire planet. They are already talking about this directly. There is a think tank led by Mr. Friedman in Stratford and they are outspoken about it. They say directly that there is nothing attractive to be offered to next generations. And it's very pleasant for me to look at uh, representatives of the youth generation today. So they are not uh, confused, uh, but uh, they tell, say directly that uh, they need supreme uh, supremacy, global supremacy, and they want to corrupt any attempts uh, to change uh, this uh, relation of forces in the global order. They have their own scenario. They are planning their own history. Managed chaos is one part of that. And manipulation. How do they manipulate everyone? If I talk about it very briefly, there are three pillars of manipulation. The first pillar is deceit, uh, which is based on self-deceit. They just deceive uh, everyone boldly 
Just take the media, how the media covers conflicts, uh, its deception, its brainwashing. The second part uh, is corruption or bribery, just simple bribes of different forms. You can just take the money or, for example, some powers uh, or vanity. You can use the vanity of someone as a tool for manipulation. And if the elite, the political elite of this global oligarch here has uh, some uh, real estate abroad, if the Russian political elite has uh, real estate abroad, if they have children abroad, which of them will have the courage uh, to support Russia? Thirdly, the principle of uh, dividing and conquering. I've talked about the need for platforms uh, of converging, of mutual understanding and developing of mutual approaches. If we see that there are approaches uh, of an alternative nature and positive prospects, if they see it, they try to overthrow them following the principle of dividing and conquering. And the first two pillars are very efficient in this. And if they can use those uh, three pillars or those three methods, uh, then this is the uh, scenario of rude violence, uh, such as military violence. This is, uh, these are the pillars uh, of their planning and their supremacy. Do we have to put up with that? Does the rest of humanity have to put up with that? Does anyone have the power to oppose this? Do we have the possibility to offer an alternative scenario to the humanity? Who is capable of it? We need uh, to look at this scientifically. Because uh, if we take an axis like the European Union, and this uh, is uh, a form of monetary and financing violence, a monetary prison of peoples, uh, and Greece, among other countries, suffers from this violence. If there is no alternative to this access, we cannot do anything. We need to look at the positive prospects and at who is capable of uh, offering an alternative. If we create another form of integration of the same kind of nature, in another geographical space, will it be attractive? Why should it be attractive if the principles are the same? Is it going to be attractive? It's not. And in the conditions of a war, alternative pro projects are, of course, very important. Please understand me. It's very important to have an alternative. But if we have other options of the European Union following the same principles, neoliberal principles, uh, the freedom of capital, movement of goods, services, and people, and the freedom, free privatization of everything and anything, then why should humankind take this alternative uh, while we already have this option, this scenario, which uh, is uh, already tested? If we do offer an alternative, we need uh, to offer a different kind of alternative, a positive alternative, socially oriented. That means uh, the option of uh, imperialistic integration. If we show it as an alternative, it's not attractive. And furthermore, in the context of a war, it has danger. Why do we need to strengthen the positions of BRICS? of uh, other unions and all the processes of coordination which are an alternative uh, to the dominant access uh, inherited from the 20th century, the order, the world order after World War II, because the survival of Russia, China, and other countries uh, who can oppose themselves to this access 
is not just a question of survival of these uh, countries and peoples. Uh, this is uh, an issue of survival of humanity itself. And uh, as it has been said very wisely from the point of view of the diplomatic experience of the United Nations, uh, we need to remind everyone that we have certain uh, regulations and rules uh, because uh, historically, uh, in the historical framework, uh, these options were offered uh, to the humanity. And first of all, it was based on that that uh, there was the correlation of powers. Uh, and on the level of this uh, relation of powers, uh, the opponents uh, were unable to set the direct threat of conquering the entire humanity. And now it's even worse. I can see that as their total dominance is something that they will try to maintain forever. This is like uh, an animal caught uh, in a corner, which is ready for anything, for genocide, uh, for total annihilation and destruction of everything. We can only stop them by offering a positive alternative. Anti-Americanism in itself does not have a lot of prospects. Nationalism, opposing their nationalism, racism, and uh, others uh, will not do anything good. If we exchange friendly opinions, why does uh, a person from Greek uh, have to choose a Russian chauvinist as an alternative to an American chauvinist or a German chauvinist? Who needs this? We need a different alternative without nationalism, without uh, chauvinism, without racism. And this requires the development of a real prospect uh, of an alternative kind. Uh, and the only such prospect I know that have been, have been abusing your time, the only such prospect uh, can be proved scientifically from the point of view of a prospect of uh, um, a logical unification of humanity. This is not just one of the options. This is the only solution for the survival of humanity in terms of positive prospects. Thank you. Thank you very much for this informative presentation. In fact, it's very interesting. And uh, thank you for suggesting this subject for a discussion. And this topic of uh, the alternative has been of particular interest to me in your presentation. Because to be honest, when you described those three pillars uh, which hold the Western hegemony, that's correct, but those three pillars are called the soft force. But within that soft force, there is nothing except for what you have already described. And there is also the brute force, uh, militaries, special operations, revolutions, and so on. And um, in my opinion, it's pointless to find an alternative to that, because it's just a tool. But the target is different. We need. Uh, to find an alternative to this target, to this objective. Uh, we take pride uh, in being part of the European civilization. So let's ask ourselves a question. In the European civilization, is there an alternative objective uh, to the global hegemony? Does it exist in principle? Has anyone showed or demonstrated this objective? Is there a European philosophy that formulated this, uh, except for Aristotle, who said back then that uh, the objective uh, of our existence uh, is to bring forward and extend the frontiers of our empire to the entire planet? Uh, does, has anyone said uh, anything else except for what Aristotle said? Uh, all the other things are just tools and means and the problem is that we do have an alternative, but in this sense, Russia is an alternative. Because for 500 years, uh, we have been opposing to projects for establishing global uh, dominance, uh, starting from uh, the Polish, uh, the 
uh, Sweden, then uh, we had Napoleon and Hitler, and now we have new governors of the world, Anglo-Saxons ones, uh, who will try to establish their own dominance. But this is uh, an alternative uh, which is resistance. Uh, while Russia is sovereign, while it controls the heart of Eurasia, no global dominance can exist. But the um, philosophical alternative, uh, the alternative of thought, what is it about, except for what Aristotle said? I think this is very important. Mr. Wimmer, I think you wanted to speak as well. I think that a very good response can be given. We can start with the reality after the end of Cold War. And I'm talking about this not as just a simple philosophy, but after the end of Cold War, <coughs> we saw that we were observing the victorious march of capitalism. And this was aimed against my own country. We followed the politics uh, of uh, social equalization. We've already, we've always been speaking about the um, social market economy. We said that uh, the economy should serve to people. We have already made our own contribution at the European level. And in this regard, we proved to be the first victims of the new world order. Second, what we can also mention is another issue that I raised. We are before a, a nebis, in front of a nebis, and we need to go away from that abyss. And this is about going back to the Paris roadmap. I can't see anything better than that. As a result of negotiations, we came to mutual understanding. And now we cannot backpedal and go back to those uh, negotiations. There is a regulation of uh, the Roman law which says that you need to listen to the other party. But the tragedy today is that no one wants to listen to Russia. If we don't go back to this European legal tradition, then we will be faced with a very hard time. And this is why I mentioned uh, the advantages of Russia today and Sputnik. In Western Europe, we don't understand well enough that Russia, starting from the year 2000, has come back uh, to a predictable state. And now that Russia has come back, we in Western Europe created a space of liberty. For example, liberty of press. In principle, we could follow the needs of uh, the social market economy only because there was an alternative uh, such as socialism, because we needed to take into consideration this alternative which existed in our own country. And this showed to us that we needed to fight for something, but not as uh, a war, but we needed to fight for peace. In terms of uh, post-Marxism, which was uh, raised, uh, you know, Marx thought that the first uh, reality was the economic reality. Um, in, in one of his uh, papers, he said that uh, everything may boil down to uh, an economic uh, formula and the breakthrough to economic Marxism. And I believe that Zinoviev School did that. 
was that uh, they managed to uh, speak about other reality, not only economic reality. And as Mr. Dimmer said, and that's the way I understand, uh, Wilmer, uh, Wilmer, the way I understand him is uh, uh, if we find alternative only in the economic aspect, uh, that's not sufficient. That's not enough. That's something that maybe will come very quickly if there's if some uh, factors disappear. And I would like to hear some comment from you as well. Well, uh, definitely these issues are very interesting, uh, and I should say that uh, justly. Uh, speaking, uh, Marx uh, has a such approach as w if we bring it to the uh, extremity, it is um, it was uh, formed as ec uh, economic determinism in its uh, extreme form, but uh, that was not something of uh, Marx's uh, ideas, original ideas. He had a certain uh, position st uh, stemming from those uh, the Zen. E economic relations and historic relations when he wrote his Das Kapital. But uh, he was forced uh, to, uh, uh, in his analysis, he was forced to transfer from uh, uh, more distant uh, um, analysis, forms of analysis, to the bas uh, basis. Uh, so reduce the uh, above forms uh, to the lower forms, to the basic forms, and uh, he. But he didn't limit himself to that. He well, he said he didn't say that there is no other way of development. Well, um, other ideas stemming from that basis and uh, relative independence of these uh, spheres uh, in the whole body. Because uh, society is a body, so we may work within this school. That's one thing. Besides that, it's necessary to keep in mind that for us to propose an alternative, we need to consider historical traditions, uh, traditions of uh, law, because there's a classical uh, um, historical school of law in Germany, for instance. But law itself and law, um, uh, law institu legal institutions and law co uh, legal consciousness, these are just uh, elements of society. We need to uh, consider them in their um, organic um, composition. Well, speaking about the government uh, within um, the European Union and about uh, the uh, southern countries, uh, being brief, I'd like to say against the background of the doom and gloom of uh, uh, the uh, current common house, which is actually a prison for nations, uh, even such cowardly approaches uh, look um, make us uh, uh, think of uh, some, uh, consider them as a, uh, as a gift. But I think we need some alternative approach. Uh, actually, we should sp uh, speak about not three pillars, but four uh, pillars. And violence is the main um, pillar that they lean on for the, to achieve their victory. Why that dominate? We live in uh, unique uh, conditions. I spoke with my uh, colleagues prior to the conference. Uh, conference. We, 75% uh, of um, Greece, for instance, in under crisis and debt colony are against uh, European Union, against uh, the um, IMF. Uh, and we have no political force that may uh, present in an uh, organized uh, way with a priority program uh, this point of view, but uh, these, um, these sentiments are being manipulated uh, w since there is no program and organized presentation of this uh, sentiment. Thank you very much. Now I give uh, the floor to Mr. Hafid Abbas, head uh, chairman of the National Commission on H of Human Rights in Indonesia, just as a Brief uh, introduction. I'd like to say that Zinoviev uh, giving a definition to one of the basic uh, historic processes of the last decades uh, that uh, is usually called globalization. 
he in his uh, natural man spoke very toughly about that there is no such thing as globalization well this name globalization is um actually what uh, what what is called globalization actually is westernization or even americanization mr abbas uh, do you agree with this statement made by Zinoviev? And uh, is it something uh, that has no alternative? Is it a process without alternative? Uh, I, um, I ask you um, this question with intention because you come from Indonesia and also you are chair of the Commission on Human Rights, which is a very Western type of organization. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, allow me on behalf of the Indonesian National Commission for Human Rights, in uh, my personal behalf, I thank you so much to Honorable Dimitri Keslov and Honorable Madame uh, Olga Sinoviev for uh, your invitation to me uh, to participate in this uh, Seventh International Conference on Sinoviev Reading, and to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the death of the Russian great thinker Sinoviev. It is indeed both honor and privilege for me to participate at this uh, very important conference at the historic city of Moscow to address the issue as. Uh, Mr. Moderator has mentioned so far the issue of globalization. Allow me to take this opportunity to share with you that how Indonesia and Russia could collaborate to reshape a world or international order. Indonesia and Russia have many in common. So allow me to share to you about Indonesia in our contemporary history. So during the last 18 years, we changed our approach to the development. We moved from authoritarian regime to democracy. We moved from centralistic system to the centralization system. We moved from very close system to the freedom of media. We moved from supremacy of or domination of politics to su supremacy of law. And that's not easy, because Indonesia, like Russia, is a very big country. We have 2 million square kilometers of land, and 6.1 million Indonesian territory is sea. So 8.1 million square kilometers, or twice much larger than the European Union. So that's not easy to manage, this country. We have about 18,000 islands so across the equator. We have the fourth largest population in the world. We have 256 million people. To manage this transition is extremely difficult. We almost call it because we started our change at the most critical time. Our economic condition at the time grows at minus 16%. So minus 16 percent, 16 below zero. But luckily now, we could jump to the ninth largest economy. So I have data here after China, United States, uh, Russia, India, Japan, Germany, Russia, and Brazil. So Indonesia is number nine. So it's amazing because there is a great change. So Indonesia has a three major role in, to address the issue for globalization. And Indonesia and Russia can benefit from this root of Indonesian history. First, we are quite strong in ASEAN region. Since last year, the 10 countries in Southeast Asian region is a committed to move into a single community of nation. We call it single ASEAN community, economically, politically, and socioculturally. We are moving 
It was similar to European Union conditions. That's, that's not easy anyhow. And secondly, Indonesia is also a very big population, uh, especially for Islamic world. We are the largest Muslim population. Two-thirds of Middle Eastern countries is equal to Indonesian populations. And the third, Indonesia is also very vital in non-aligned movement. We declare the Asian African Conference in 1955. And a few years later, we initiated the establishment of non-aligned movement. So 114 countries under non-aligned movement. So to address globalization, there are three actors over here. One is the capital, capitalistic world. And Sinovev has mentioned so far that the nature of capitalistic nations. So uh, that's not easy to balance the capitalistic system. And the second is the socialistic. So during Soviet Union, so the Second World War under the control of Soviet Union, and hopefully Russia could lead the, the Second World War, the Second World. And the third is the non-aligned movement initiated by Indonesia. So Indonesia and Russia could collaborate much closer to address the global issues, to reshape international order. At the moment, what we are observing that there is a tyranny for the polarization of power because of too much strong at the capitalistic world and the domination of United States. So there is a totalitarian approach to the global community. So if I may share to you then that last 25th October 2015, Tony Blair made a very sincere apology to the world and it was recorded in CNN and all media in the world, that please accept my sincere apology for the conspiracy that I made to destroy Iraq. And a few days before that, also President Obama made also similar apology that he made a mistake why he destroyed Libya. That's 15 September 2015. So now there's the absence to control the polarization of the world. So if Russia and Indonesia to represent the non-aligned movement in the second world, that could create a new balance for the world polarizations. Let me share to you that the reaction of non-aligned movement and Mahathir Muhammad sent a letter to uh, President Obama, it's a very touching content of the letter. They put over here nine messages. One is that, uh, Mr. President, President Obama, stop killing people. Yes, and a very long description about uh, this point. And second is stop indiscriminate support of Israel and third is stop applying sanction against countries which cannot the same again with you. If you are not with us, so you must be our enemy. So that's the uh, spirit of President Bush's uh, speech during uh, the addressing the terrorism issue. And the fourth point that Mahathir uh, share is stop your scientists and researchers from inventing new and more uh, diabolical weapon to kill more people more efficiently. So don't use your technology to destroy human family. And stop trying to discriminate all countries in the world that are not democratic or not the same with you. And the next, the seven is stop the casino which you can called financial institution. They use the money to, you see, uh, 
the isolate the weaker nations. And the eight signed the Kyoto Protocol and other international agreement. So U.S. should not under respect United Nations. So Mahathir put there, they proposed that U.S. to respect United Nations. So this is really very vital that the new order should be immediately reshaped to create a proper balance between the first, the second, and the third world. And I sincerely hope that if Indonesia and Russia could, could establish a common dialogue to address those devastated countries, especially in Middle East and North Africa, that could be a great achievement to reshape international order. And also we could share, Indonesia could share the experience they have during the last two decades for how Indonesia could recover and could reconcile and promote uh, peace across the country and also across the region. And also Indonesia and Russia could exchange experiences and best practices for lesson learned that to share the success story that Indonesia had made to share to the world. And the last is that quite many capacity building that the two nations could jointly contribute to the world. So I think uh, with this uh, reflection, uh, the new international order could be made if the agenda between Russia and Indonesia could elaborate in more comprehensively uh, to address it jointly for the benefit of all human family. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Abbas. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting contribution. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Kickwood, uh, Professor of Philosophy from Scotland. It said not uh, United Kingdom, but Scotland. Actually, and, it, and I've got an interesting question. Uh, Brexit, is that uh, surprised many of us. Uh, many of us thought that nothing will happen, actually. Well, they will have this hustle and bustle and then come down and nothing will happen. But Brexit, uh, at least in the, at the level of referendum, happened. And now they discuss whether it will be, its decisions will be enforced. So many variants, many options, many alternatives, I would say, as uh, our guest from uh, Greece said, that there are many alternatives of implementation of uh, the referendum. So the question is, is that a planned action or it's is it a natural action? Just it happened naturally that uh, Brexit took place. So I will hold it closer to my mouth. I'm talking about the mic. It's walking. I'm not going to talk about the future referendum in Scotland. I knew it, but I had to ask. This is a democratic country. If the people decides what to do, then it should be like that. I'm against the second referendum because nothing has changed, even though they do say, some Scottish parliamentarians say that now the majority is for independence. But this is not reflected in the polls. So I force Scotland staying or remaining within Great Britain for various reasons. But if there is a Brexit, that's a catastrophe as far as I understand. It was a mistake. David Cameron had a problem inside the uh, Conservative Party because uh, some uh, wanted to stay, others wanted to leave. And it was decided to do this uh, by a referendum while thinking that it would be a very simple solution.
that the British people would vote for staying within the European Union. But uh, it proved to be different. The decision was a different one. And of course, no one knows what will happen. There has been no planning. No one knows what a Brexit means. They want to know what will be the result. So I'm not going to go there in depth because no one knows what's going to happen. I'm a pessimist by nature. I'm a pessimist because my life has been full of pleasant surprises. And this uh, reaffirms my pessimism. I prefer having a pleasant surprise rather than an unpleasant disappointment. That's why being a pessimist is better than being an optimist. I have been looking for a predicate here, Alexander Zinoviev, reality of planned history. For me, this has different meanings because Alexander Zinoviev incarnates the reality of planned history. And what would he have said had he been here with us today? Would he have agreed that uh, he um, incarnated the reality of planned history? Who and who forms the global world order and how? Once again, it's not clear for me. There's the absence of the question mark there, for example. I don't know what it means. Is it a plan or a project or a recipe? And I would like to um, offer a different question with a question mark. How can one resist to the forming of uh, a global world order without order, of a global world without order? I think this is a more important question because uh, chaos has been growing around the world inside countries and everywhere. That's what's happening in the United States. It's a circus. Uh, take uh, the election campaign. That's a nightmare. In the United States, in the 21st century, that's a circus. I just don't understand it, on the one hand. On the other hand, they say that the United States is a great power, a great military force, but I do not understand America. America doesn't understand itself because the population is split into two parts. And it's not good. The same goes for the European situation. Great Britain is not in a good situation. Everything is split, is divided, is disintegrating everything in which I believed when I was younger. And today I sit here and I don't know what to think about the future. But two minutes about Alexander Zinoviev. For many years, I have been working on his uh, books uh, with growing interest and uh, enthusiasm and respect. But the two books that sum it up is communism as a reality on the one hand and we and the West on the other hand. In those two books, uh, he um, carried out an in-depth analysis of the communist regime. And in the book, uh, We and the West, he did the same about the West. As for his second book, I liked it less. You will probably think that I am a Westerner, but I gradually came to a conclusion that this book also rendered a great service to, the, to humanity because he foresaw many things that uh, would happen after his death as a prophet. 
related to the communist regime, he didn't uh, foresee many things uh, uh, with respect to what uh, happened to the communism. He foresaw the future for the communist regime, which would probably last for 5,000 years, but this did not happen. But when we talk about the forming of the global world order, I believe that this cannot be explained without certain bureaucratization. Bureaucratization is not a help helpful thing. For instance, I remember well the 1990s when I became a Glasgow professor and I met with some new colleagues, many of whom were from Czechia, Slovakia, and so on. Together with them, we stated immediately that the process uh, in the British university system was that of bureaucratization, whereas my colleagues from Eastern Europe saw the pro process of Sovietization. I agreed with them. But I don't see any big difference between Sovietization and bureaucratization. Maybe the style of bureaucratization is important, but bureaucratization in itself is about pressure. It cannot exist without pressurizing, without pressure. So plan history for me sounds uh, more like a negative thing than rather than a positive thing. But I'm not going to, stop, to talk more. I'm not going to compete with my colleagues here. I just want to finish by saying thank you to Olga and the Zinoviev Club for an invitation to speak here. I'm really touched by this award. I'm really touched by this. And this is how I'm going to finish my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a couple of words, if I may. I believe that we have touched upon some very interesting aspects. Uh, the topic of planned history in terms uh, of its uh, historical nature. If a person discusses planned history, he or she should be a person interested in history. And I think that Zinoviev mentioned this uh, and his disciple, Dravinsky, already liked to repeat that a person should uh, undertake some extreme effort to become a historical person. The greatness and tragedy of uh, a person as a historical creature is that uh, he and history live uh, in very different uh, eras. As usual, a person would really love uh, to understand whether he acted uh, rightly or wrongly. And uh, it was said that uh, this will be learned by uh, other people when my bones rot. And in this sense, planned history is about big history. And it's very important, the thing that our colleague from Greece said. Why do we look uh, at the first uh, experiment of socialism or communism that took place as uh, finished history, as if this idea died? By the way, our Western colleagues uh, wrote at once in 1992, this is the end of history, and that's it. In this sense, uh, I would like to tell them, dear friends, you probably don't understand anything about history. 
Of course, uh, this historical challenge is very serious, and several generations uh, need to face it. And the fact that Zinoviev wrote uh, this work, Communism, as a reality, he said, this is communism. There is no other communism, no other communism exists. Uh, and today we look at the Western world. Uh, our colleague said, what's happening there? Is it uh, a circus uh, in, um, mm, uh, in a perfect democracy? They s tell everyone that we are the perfect democracy. We are a role model, do like us. Uh, and he said, this is a circus. But actually, just look at what's happening. Trump uh, is uh, accused of saying a frightful thing. It turns out that women want to be with rich and famous men, and they can do anything they want with women. The entire American society accused Trump of saying that. But no one asked uh, what Ms. Levinsky did uh, together with uh, the President of the United States uh, when she was a trainee. So they are not ready to answer that question. Democracy as a reality. This is the democracy we have. There is no other democracy. And uh, in those uh, American elections, this is the democracy that exists. Uh, that's the same that Dinoviev wrote, communism as a reality. This is communism. These are the simple historical realities. Thank you, everyone, who participated in the, the first panel. We are having a break. Uh, and I have seen Yevgeny Popov come up. He is going to moderate the second panel. And I invite the participants once again to be back here at uh, 2.30 to resume our discussions. Thank you.